Hi, welcome to the SAG After Foundation's Conversations at Home. I'm Janelle Riley. I'm an editor at Variety. I want to let you know the SAG After Foundation has a COVID-19 relief fund to support SAG After artists during this time. Information on how you can support this effort can be found in the description of this video. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Zachary Quinto. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you so much for having me. Good to see you. You too. Um, as this is primarily a SAG audience, I actually always like to start by asking, how did you get your SAG card? Um, I think I got, oh, it's so long ago now, Janelle. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think I got my SAG card through commercials, actually. Uh, when I first moved to LA, uh, I did that sort of, you know, that actor hustle of waiting tables and auditioning um, for both you know, guest stars and things and also commercials. And I think I got it doing, I want to say it was like a Doritos commercial. Oh, a product yeah. I believe in. So, so that's good. <laughs> <laughs> Who doesn't believe in Doritos, by Thank the way? Thank you. I mean, I didn't want to assume, but yeah, yeah. No, I'm pretty sure that's how it came to be. <laughs> and now here we are all this way, 2020. Um, you have The Boys in the Band, now on Netflix. Um, and I, I actually want to go to the beginning because I know you played Harold in the 2018 Broadway revival, which I was lucky enough to see. Um, uh -huh. Going back all that way, which I guess is only two years ago, but still. <laughs> Feels like a lifetime does, ago at this right? point, doesn't it? <clears throat> what uh, initially attracted you to that role and to the project overall? Well, um, that's the role I was invited to play. So, um, you know, the opportunity to be a part of such an incredible ensemble um, of entirely out gay actors um, uh, directed by the incredible Joe Mantello, um, who I've been friends with for a very long time and have wanted to work with for almost all of that time. So, um, you know, those two things um, primarily were, were the, the draw for me into the project. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm constantly looking to get back on stage. Uh, and so it was a great opportunity for me to do another play. Um, and yeah, I just, I felt like there was a kind of momentum around the project mm -hmm. that was really exciting. And, uh, even, even before, um, we went into rehearsal and, and before we did it and before we, we knew what kind of an impact it would have, um, there felt like a kind of unique and special energy um, that I was really grateful to to be invited to participate in. And when you say you were invited, was it by Joe or was it Ryan Murphy or a combination? Yes, it was Ryan. Ryan um, put together a reading of the of the play that Joe directed in. I think it was February. I want to say it was. It was like February of 2017, I think. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm wrong, but I think it was. It might have been September, but it was, it was the year before we did it. So we did a reading of it. And then based on that reading, um, we decided to do a production of it the following year. So there was, there was a long time between when we all came together at first and then you know, we went into rehearsal for it. Um, and then, you know, we did the play all through the summer of 2018 and then we had an entire year off and then came back again, uh, to do the film. And then, you know, a year later the film came out. So it was almost a three year long journey with this one project, which is so unique and, uh, and such an incredible way to, um, immerse oneself in, sorry, I've been watching the queen, uh, I mean the crown. <laughs> Who has um, it? <laughs> <laughs> I literally can't believe I just said immerse oneself. <laughs> it was though. It was an incredible way to um, to immerse ourselves in in the work and uh, and just have this this really um, yeah. It was a profound experience. I would say. Did you know when you were doing the play that it might be adapted for the screen, or did they tell you that later? I, I didn't know. There were there were sort of rumblings of a future <laughs> life for the for the piece, like. Uh, I remember, I remember hearing like, oh, they, they want to do it in LA or they want to do it in San Francisco. Like they want to do like a mini tour uh, or something, uh, which seemed unlikely just based on, you know, everybody's availabilities. Um, so I wasn't shocked when the movie came back around, but um, it wasn't something that we were anticipating when, when we did the play. So when you find out you're going to be filming it, um, 
do you have to re-prepare for the character? Do you have to do different preparation? Um, I'm so curious about the process of doing something on stage and then doing it on film. Um, you know, it was a really unique experience to uh, to do the play and then have a year off and then come back to it in an, an entirely different medium. So I think the modulations happened pretty organically. I was surprised at how quickly um, things came back like lines. Uh, uh, you know, we, we did have a bit of a rehearsal period, which was amazing um, before we started shooting. Um, but things kind of fell into place in a way. And then obviously there are adjustments that we all needed to make, but, um, but I just think that they happened without too much effort. And I think that's a real gift of having had the opportunity of the run of the play. It was, uh, it was an amazing foundation on which we could build, or I guess rebuild, um, you know, this experience. Um, it was amazing that part of it. Going back to uh, the theater, it's, uh, I love it so much because anything can happen. It's like a living, breathing object. Um, what are some of your favorite memories from performing it on stage? Mm. Or maybe not favorite, but just like, you know, crazy things can happen in audiences. Yeah, sometimes. crazy things can happen. It's true. I mean, for me with this play, uh, I, you know, I always develop, I think, a lot of actors do, although I can't speak for anyone else, but uh, you know, I always develop these kind of rituals when I'm doing a play. There's something, um, there's something almost devotional about doing theater, which is why I love it so much. Um, you know, you show up in the same place at the same time every night, you stand in the same place on stage, your body does the same things as you're saying the same lines. There's this kind of like, you know, with theater, for me, the kinds of discoveries that you can make happen over time. It's like water eroding a rock, you know, it may take forever, but in the end, you know, you could have the Grand Canyon. The depth of what you're able to explore is just much more um, significant over time. Whereas when you're working in film and television, um, the goal is to capture a moment. The goal mm. is um, you know, to be as available as you can be to instincts and impulses um, and, uh, and a good director, a good editor uh, is going to find um, the, the, the moment of a performance that will live forever, but it only existed once um, and it will never exist again. And so there's a real difference for me in the process. Um, and so I just loved, you know, I would have my, the time that I would leave my house to make sure I got the train, to make sure I could stop and get a coffee, to make sure that I would get to the theater in time. And then I had the whole process of putting Harold on every night. And, and on Broadway, that was up to me. Obviously, when we did the movie, there was an incredible team of hair and makeup um, designers that, that did that with and for me. But, uh, but on Broadway, um, I put everything on my prosthetics I did my own makeup I put on my own wig and there was something about the timing of that every night and I would listen to the first 30 minutes of the show before I come on stage over the monitor and so I could always tell what kind of audience I was going to arrive in front of um, before I even left my dressing room um, and that was always great but there was such an energy in the booth theater in New York when we were doing the show it was you know, the 50th anniversary of the play's premiere. It, we, did the, the, um, we did the play over the summer, so it was during Pride Month. Um, there was just such a buzz. Um, and I think a lot of us weren't sure how the play would land for contemporary audiences. And so it was really exciting to hear just how um, viscerally people were responding to it and, uh, and showing up for it. Uh, that was always really exciting. In terms of like, you know, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, 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 please, you, go. Uh, I was just going to say in terms of um, unexpected kind of interactions, uh, you know, always the weekend crowds tend to be a little bit more uh, raucous, you know, because they'll stop off for a, a pre-theater cocktail sometimes. Uh, so there were nights where, you know, I remember one night I came on stage and I had, you know, one of, one of Harold's, uh, many kind of one-liners, zingers, and some, some I can only assume some gay gentleman from the audience after I, after I said the line just went as loud as could be, oh, Harold, oh, Harold. Like, 
you know, just like talking back to me on the stage and everybody was just like, wait, what's happening? You know, those kinds of things would happen, but they were fun. The, I was, that's actually what I was going to say is that Harold has some of the, the great lines, especially the little, the little bitchy one-liners. And, and people... Little bitchy one-liners. <laughs> <laughs> I think it'd be really yeah. hard not to break, actually, on stage sometimes. Mm. Um, yes. Uh, <laughs> there were times, I mean, we had such a great, um, there was such a great energy between all of us. I just, you know, there was a real love in that company and, uh, and it would, it would creep into our relationships on stage sometimes. Um, the great news is when you're working with such pros, um, it's, uh, it's a fine line, but we usually manage to stay on the right side of it. Uh, yeah. you know, but we can have little asides or little looks or little, um, little whispers that the audience can't quite pick up on that, uh, that are just, a, that, you know, that's the great part about doing theater. Um, that crackling liveliness. Um, but yeah, I mean, and also on, on set when we're doing the movie, um, there were many moments of, uh, I just think we, we just really enjoyed not only being with each other, but watching each other. I mean, some of my favorite parts of filming the movie were, you know, just sitting in Video Village and watching Jim, um, Andrew, Matt, I mean, just watching my fellow actors do their thing, you know, because everybody in this film um, has a, a beautiful moment or, or, or a number of them. But, you know, it was really architected in a way that I think gives everybody such an opportunity to shine. And it was great to see that. I don't know why it surprises me so much, but it never occurred to me that you had to do your own makeup um for the broadway run yeah, on broadway that's the that's the broadway i mean unless you're doing something that's like a real like prosthetic or like a real transformation you know yeah most most um most actors do their own beats um which is fun i mean i i i don't i never if i'm not doing something like i when i was doing glass menagerie or you know i i don't i don't wear makeup unless i have to but it's a great, it was a great part of the process of, of, of being able to put this character into the world. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, uh, yeah, but yeah, I had to do my own makeup. You Can heard you it here. <laughs> Can you talk about sort of deciding on the look? I mean, obviously as the wig oh. and the sideburns and, mm -hmm. but um, I think I was reading that, that you put pockmarks. Yeah. Yes. Uh, for both the play and the, film. I mean, the play was more about calibrating it myself with Joe and Ryan using stage makeup, but we did have prosthetics. We did have these transfers um, that were made so that I glued those onto my face every night uh, and they were textured. And then I filled in the pockmarks that were in the transfers with makeup. And then I put makeup over everything to kind of even it out. But that was a real, I mean, during, during tech rehearsal in the theater when we were, you know, mounting the play, um, that was a real process to figure out the levels so that it didn't look too much and that, you know, but it's still read to the audience. I mean, the reality is that someone sitting in the, you know, the mezzanine or the, you know, the back of the house and the balcony is not going to see the detail of, of the makeup that I'm doing, but it was more to inform the character in a lot of ways. And, Joe would really, you know, have input on that. And then, and then Ryan, Ryan, Ryan and I went to Sephora in Times Square together actually to buy some makeup, which was hilarious. And, uh, and then he sort of gave me a little tutorial of like what he thought it should be. So I had, I had some good collaborators in terms of finding the, the levels of makeup. Um, that was fun, actually. That's amazing. I love that. Yeah. Um, obviously you have experience with, with makeup and prosthetics famously in, in, in Star Trek, but how does it help you to find a character when you put on, you know, that wig or, or, you know, the, that complexion, um, mm -hmm. it sounds simplistic, but I, I know a lot of people say like that, that's where they really feel like, okay, now I am this person. Yeah, it does help to inform a physicality. Um, certainly it helps to inform vocal choices. Um, I do think that there are values in uh, a transformative process 
that um, that are unique. And, uh, you know, there are certain ways in which I am able to relate to Harold. And then there are ways in which I'm not able to relate to him at all. And some of the um, some of the elements that I literally put on, um, whether that means costume, um, shoes are always incredibly important to me um, in terms of my connection to a character. Um, you know, those are those to me are the things that uh, that I value in my process, whether or not there are prosthetics or applications or wigs or makeup um, is kind of secondary, but there, there is, you know, all those things add up. And so I feel like, um, working with Lou Eirich, the, the incredible costume designer for the film, um, was such a great process. Um, you know, from the play to the movie, we really rooted the piece in the time period. Like the play was a little bit more, um, uh, ambiguous in terms of, it was obviously set in, 1968, but um, but the set and the costumes were suggestive of that time period, not naturalistically representative of that time period. And then when we moved to the film, um, that became you know much more detail oriented. And so I showed up to my first costume fitting with Lou. I worked with her a number of times before. She's amazing, and she sort of unfurled these bolts of jewel toned velvet. And I realized that we were entering into this other level of, um, of, of both opulence and detail. And that began this process of figuring out, you know, how Harold would represent himself, you know, in an emerald green velvet suit is a, is a declarative um, um, choice. And so we built things around that, you know, and, uh, and it was an incredible experience to really feel like uh, we were finding a new manifestation of who this person is in the world. And I would love to talk about working with the rest of this cast, especially because you yeah. did it in two different mediums. I mean, it's, you know, Jim Parsons and Matt Bomer and Andrew Reynolds, I, like just from top to bottom. But something I've noticed about your career is that you <coughs> can find yourself in these amazing ensembles. I mean, going back to like Margin Call and Heroes mm -hmm. and Star Trek, is that something you sort mm -hmm. of seek out? Mm -hmm. It's something I feel so incredibly uh, fortunate to um, to be able to say. Um, I really, I really have had the great good fortune of working with incredible actors and and really good people um, as well. For the most part, uh, you know, I I really I don't take that for granted. Um, and this, you know, I was I was I went to college with Matt Bomer. Uh, I've been friends with Andrew and Jim for years. I did a movie with Charlie Carver. I did a play with Brian Hutchison. Um, you know, there was a lot of pre-existing camaraderie for me in this company. Um, and, and other people have like really interesting, like Andrew and Michael Benjamin Washington have known each other for years. And there, there was just a lot of um, interconnected um, familiarity and, and uh, friendship going into this. So that that's always a joy when you can show up and work with your friends in that way. And, and then to just be inspired by them as artists, you know, to see them in different, you know, to see Jim doing the kind of work he was doing in The Boys in the Band um, after such a long run as a character that people really came to associate him with and, uh, and, appreciate him for to watch him go in such a different direction so confidently and so skillfully um, was really inspiring. Um, and I feel that way about everybody. I mean, watching all of my fellow actors work in this piece um, really, really inspired me and, and, and influenced me just, just feeling like, wow, you know, watching Top Watkins do his monologue every night on stage and just, just literally sitting there being like, God, he's so good, you know? Um, and, and I, I really feel that way about everybody, Robin and Michael. And I mean, it's just an incredible group of guys. And I think they're, I think they're all really, really talented. As fun as Harold is for the audience, um, he also requires you to go to some sort of darker, unpleasant places at times. Mm. Um, are you the kind of actor who takes your work home with you? Is that ever difficult um, some days? Mm -mm. I'm not the kind of actor that takes my work home with me. Um, 
sometimes it it does affect me more on stage than on screen. Um, like when I was doing Angels in America, I took my work home with me kind of, um, you know, um, inadvertently, just the toll that that piece, you know, as, as powerful as it is, it's incredibly um, difficult. Um, so, so there, I should say like, I shouldn't be so definitive about it. There are times when, uh, when I do, but I, I do, I feel like I've spent a lot of time in my life um, creating boundaries and, uh, and space for myself to, to feel safe um, in my work. And so I don't, I don't, I don't fancy getting lost in, uh, in psyches that aren't my own um, or psychologies that are dark or dangerous. And I've played a lot of dark and dangerous characters. So I've learned over the years how to um, take care of myself. Um, and so uh, I think I can go there when I need to, but I don't think that I blur the lines in a way. Um, I think everybody's different. You know, you have different techniques and different processes. And, uh, and mine has always been about um, understanding, um, you know, the craft of what we do and, uh, and implementing it and aspiring to it in a way that allows me to keep those boundaries clear. I think that's just how I move through the world. Um, I respect people that have different, different philosophies on that, you know, um, and I learn from them, certainly. But I try to I try to make sure that I can keep um, solid ground beneath mm -hmm. my feet. Uh, what has been the most difficult role to shake? I just finished watching Nosferatu, so oh, <laughs> you're interesting. Dark places. I'm like, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's gonna yeah. take me a um, while to shake. <laughs> yeah, well, that's good. That's how it should be, actually. You know, we should do our job so that that audiences have an experience that is, um, you know. Um, if not indelible, certainly long lasting. But um, I think uh, I think the theater work that I've done has been the most um, doing the glass menagerie was really, um, you know, th there's there are a lot. I, I I learned so much about Tennessee Williams. I felt so connected to him during that time, and I also have uh, had a you know, a complicated relationship with my mother in my own way. And so to live in a world every night where that's being explored and examined and, uh, and delved into was something that I felt like really um, was a part of my awareness, even when I wasn't uh, at the theater. And again, Angels in America, you know, really physicalized that. Uh, I played Lewis, who's an incredibly uh, tightly wound, self-loathing kind of person. And I definitely felt that there were physical manifestations of that character. That's the other thing when you're, when you're doing a play, right? Your physical body, because you're, you know, for this period of time every night, your body is, is moving in the same way. And so there's a repetitive nature to how um, our bodies don't know the difference between truth and uh and and fiction and even though we do consciously and even though we as actors can make the choice to to separate those things our bodies don't necessarily have the same mechanism of discernment and so uh you know putting ourselves into incredibly emotional situations that are physicalized night after night after night there are ways that our bodies can form around those emotional states. And so I think body work is incredibly important during any run of a play. I mean, in general, I think it's really important for what we do. Um, but I do at least two times or three times a week when I'm doing a play, make sure that I, you know, have different kinds of body work, massage, acupuncture, things that are going to keep me in a neutral state so that, uh, but but Angels in America was a tough one, you know. Mm. I, I really that was a long run of a of a of a really intense play, and I and by the end of it, I really I needed to do some real work to kind of break myself out of that. Um, but in terms of film, I mean, the darkness of the second season of American Horror Story was pretty uh, pretty intense, you know. Yeah. Um, 
So there was a lot, and, and the research that I had to do to play that character, you know, researching like real life uh, serial killers uh, and, and reading things and seeing things that were so unfathomably dark, uh, that was pretty full on. Um, but a lot of the other stuff I've done, you know, like you mentioned Osferatu, but there's a, a whole kind of supernatural element to that, which um, made a difference in uh, in my relationship to it. Not to mention the kind of heaps of prosthetics and things that I was able to um, disappear into um, to play that role. So I don't know, I feel like the other stuff I see, you know, we know how they make the sausage. And so it, it doesn't really feel like um, I get I get too confused about the boundaries of that, but um, mm -hmm. we'll see. Maybe I haven't played the role yet that's going to really find its way into my life. Um, I'm curious, you know, Boys in the Band, you mentioned you were doing it on stage during its 50 year anniversary. What do you think this story continues to resonate so many years after its premiere? I wasn't sure it would resonate actually. Um, and I think, uh, I think what Mart Crowley, the amazing writer of the piece, um, tapped into ultimately was something that was universal. And I think that it's relatable to audiences of all different um, backgrounds and experiences. I mean, I don't think you have to be gay to relate to the kind of longing and the kind of um, acceptance that these characters are striving for. Um, you know, it's, it's a story told through the perspective of the gay experience and more specifically through the gay male experience in the late 1960s. So there's a, a social context that I think is really um, unique. But beyond that, I think everybody wants to be accepted both by themselves and the people around them and, you know, and loved. And I don't think that it's gotten any easier to find that acceptance in the 52 years since this play was written. If anything, it's probably gotten more difficult with the advent of technology and social media influence our culture as much as it does now. Um, it's um it's something that I think he really tapped into in a way and really um, embodies in these characters in um, in a funny, moving, and relatable way. Um, so that to me is 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 a big part of the reason why it still resonates. And it's funny, you know, it's it's funny until it's not. But when it's funny, it's really funny. Do you ever think you'll play a character who gets to make as great an opening entrance as Harold? I mean, that must have been so fun every night. It's a good one. Yeah. I mean, on stage, it was a really cool, um, cause as I said, you know, I'd been listening to the whole show on the monitor. So I knew the kind of level of engagement that the audience was, was, um, was putting forward before I went down, but, but that whole process of walking down, you know, getting ready and, and sort of descending the stairs to the stage and walking backstage to the door and, and then, yeah, like it was, uh, it was great fun. And to recreate that for the film was a unique experience and a bit of a, an interesting challenge, I think is a real testament to Joe uh, Mantello um, and his, um, his, his great skill as a filmmaker actually. And also his openness to collaboration because I think we were both trying to figure out, well, how do we create this moment, you know? And uh, we had an incredible props department on the film who gave us so many different things to play with. And, you know, the whole set was just uh, covered with these amazing um, uh, trinkets and intricacies from that time. And, uh, and the prop master came to me with a number of different cigarette cases to choose from for the character. And one of them had this mirrored lid uh, and I and I thought, well, this is a just amazing because I think, of course, Harold would have a mirrored cigarette case. Um, but then when it came time to <clears throat> when it came time to block the entrance, Joe and I were talking, and and I showed him the mirrored cigarette case, and I was like, I wonder if we could somehow use this to recreate when 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 we did the entrance on stage. Um, Matt Bomer's character Donald opens the door. And Harold was sort of lounging in the door frame with his back to the audience. And then he whips around to take in the scene of the party. And so I thought, is there a way to do that on film? 
and the mirrored cigarette case gave us that opportunity. So I showed it to Joe and I said, you know, and Bill Pope, the amazing DP of, of the film, um, we sort of had this little conference and I said, you know, is there a way to use this so that I can have my back to the party when the door opens? And they really uh, were open to that idea. And, and, uh, and I, I think it worked well in terms of approximating that same level of anticipation and the dramatic flair of Harold's entrance uh, in the film. Yeah, I love the way he snaps the case. <laughs> like, it tells you so much you need to know about the character. Just taking, right yeah, just like, you know, like make, checking his makeup, making sure he's all together. And yeah, and then like, okay, here we go. Uh, I'm, I've arrived. There is something very declarative about it. Um, is it strange to be saying goodbye to Harold after so many years with him? Or, or maybe you guys have another thing planned. Maybe there's a, a musical or some sort of- Maybe album. we're going to do that 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 tour after all. Yeah. Uh, I think, you know, there's a real sense of completion. Um, there's a real sense of, uh, of exploring this character from as many different angles as possible, literally and figuratively. And, uh, and, you know, to bring it full circle from a moment where I wasn't entirely sure that I wanted to do this play at first. Uh, it took me a minute to kind of it took me a minute to get like on the same page as everybody else, I would say. Uh, and, and now looking back, you know, the thought that I would have ever said no to this or not had this experience, the thought that I would be sitting in my living room or sitting in the, the theater, you know, uh, as an audience member watching my friends do this play and this film and, you know, that, that I would have missed the opportunity is, um, is is an aching thought and feeling, and I'm so grateful that um, that I that you know I I made the decision to do it because uh, it was it was you know I don't it it was an incredible journey, and so I don't feel like there's anything I didn't get to explore or experience with it, you know, um, and you can't always say that, so uh, so for that I'm really grateful, and uh, and also to be able to share it with such a wider audience now that it's out as a film. Um, is something that's really meaningful too. Cause I think, you know, for, for, for gay people and particularly young gay people in parts of the world um, where they may not see themselves reflected in the people around them in their communities and their cultures and their societies. Uh, I feel honored to be a part of a company of all gay actors, um, you know, and, uh, and representing how far we've come since this piece originally premiered in the late sixties and uh and also a little bit of a, of a beacon and a call to arms for how far we've yet to go. Mm -hmm. um, that feels really um, meaningful. And uh, so I'm, I'm glad that it lives on in that way. And uh, we can share with so many more people. Well, I'm so glad also that it's available on Netflix so people can not only watch it, they can watch it again and again. Um, they can replay your entrance as many times as they <laughs> want. Um, and on behalf of the SAG After Foundation, I want to thank you so, so much for being here today and sharing your craft and your stories with us. Well, thanks for having me. I always enjoy um, talking to, um, to my colleagues and, uh, and it's, a, yeah, it's a pleasure. So I appreciate it and uh, take care, stay safe. Uh, and I look forward to doing this again in person someday. Be fantastic. Hopefully, hopefully soon. <laughs> Indeed, sooner than later. <laughs>